welcome back to Cause of Spirit. So fun to see a few new faces and dear friends that we have missed having in person coffee at the Cosmos. So thank you to those of you that got out this morning and spread the word. This is going to be a quarterly function for the next year or so as we make sure that we're safe and that we have great content for you. So spread the word. And I want to thank all of our Facebook Live friends for joining us as well. And I know a lot of you tuned in virtually as we were bringing you streaming coffee at the Cosmo. And we think that we have some great content. The best part is, if you like what you find today, you can find more on our website and on our Facebook page because we record all of this programming and then it's available online for your use at any time. It will also become part of our virtual resources that we're going to be making available to the public this fall. So stay tuned for that. And we have some great things coming up. Not only do we have the famous and fabulous Jim Remark coming to talk to you about his, his expertise in space history at L7, but as you all are probably aware, because it's all over your tables and we hope all over the internet. Uh, this is coming up on the 60th anniversary of the LB7 mission, which is uh, the 21st of July. So on that day, it's going to be a big day here because who has the Liberty Bell 7? We do. We do. And it is a we. Our community is home to the Liberty Bell 7. That is such great news. So bring your friends back on Wednesday. Starting at 12.30, Jim will be doing a similar but different presentation. <laughs> and building questions, and then followed by Jim's presentation, looking back at Mercury, we'll have a representative from NASA who will be looking forward to Artemis, and she's the communications director for the Artemis program, and will be able to tell us a lot of her stories and insight into that program and the things on which we stand on the brink. Of space exploration. So we're looking forward to that. Um, and the other anniversaries have, have coming up, Michelle, help me if I'm wrong, but Jim and I 10 is this Sunday, right? Um, yes. Yes, this Sunday. And then what happens on July 20th, the anniversary of what? Mm -hmm. Oh, God. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Woo, thank you. <laughs> Apollo 11's anniversary. And we have artifacts representing all of those missions. So make sure that if you run across any friends in your circles that don't know what the cosmos is about, this is a great week to bring them in. And we have some scavenger hunt sheets by the door that's all about Liberty Bell 7. So if you do take a chance to stroll through the museum, go on a scavenger hunt like you. So with no further ado, I want to introduce our CEO and President, Jim Remar, who is indeed a noted expert on all things space history, particularly New York Great Gemini and Apollo missions. In fact, he was just interviewed for a, a very popular podcast last Thursday. So he's really our man of the day. Thank you, Mamie. I'm by no means an expert, so I'll try. <laughs> Uh, I do want to thank um, our marketing and development team for um, setting up for the Coffee at the Cosmo. Um, Michelle and Kelsey and Mimi and Maria um, all did a phenomenal job getting us back live. And thank you to Sam uh, getting the room set up. So it's, it's great to see everybody back. Um, it's, it's <clears throat> warms my heart, I think, the, the heart of all our uh, team here to, to see people in the building. I will tell you that this summer has, has been fantastic. Um, we're having probably our best summer in the last five or six years. So um, people are coming back and they're coming back in droves. And, uh, it's, it's fun to see, but it's also more exciting uh, to, to see people coming back and knowing that we have significant anniversary celebrations in the month of July. As Mimi said, where else but the Cosmosphere do you get to see? artifacts related to those anniversary celebrations. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to begin my presentation on Mercury and Liberty Bell 7. So uh, this all started back in 
October 4th of 1957, um, with a satellite, a little larger than uh, basketball, um, was launched. Uh, obviously, uh, Sputnik 1 uh, was launched October 4th, 1957. And that was really the, the first shot across the bat. Uh, the, the Soviets scored the first, um, and that really set in motion what was going to come into play <laughs> over the, the next uh, 10 plus years. Uh, that first shot, uh, the Sputnik 1 launch, uh, set the space race in motion. Um, and so starting in 57 until Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon in uh, July 1969, uh, it was a race to space, um, and it was to see uh, who could be first. Um, and it was also not only a race to see who could be first, but it was also about ideology. Whose ideology, whose political system was better? Uh, that of the Communist Soviet Union or that of the Democratic United States of America? And so the space race, while it was part of the Cold War, um, was as much about ideology, propaganda, uh, and signifying to the world the superiority uh, of the country as it was about technology and being first. Um, if you'll recall, in World War II, Eisenhower and his and the Allies took great advantage of, of propaganda, and they utilized propaganda to uh, help spread the word, but also to signify that they were making inroads or that the tide of the world was turning. Well, that was a lesson that Eisenhower took with him to his presidency, and it was a lesson that he utilized during uh, his presidency uh, during the initial stages of the Cold War. So the space race starts. So there were a number of firsts and some embarrassments. Uh, obviously, Sputnik 1, uh, soon followed by Sputnik 2, uh, which got Laika, uh, the first living creature, uh, to go into orbit. Uh, and then our first embarrassment, uh, which was Vanguard. Uh, Vanguard was a Navy project, an attempt to launch our first satellite. Uh, in fact, you can see uh, the flight ready back up of Vanguard down in our museum. Uh, but Vanguard got a few feet off the ground before it exploded, uh, and was referred to in the press by Flopnik, the Flipnik, um, all the Sputnik references. So we got our first satellite up, Explorer 1, and then shortly thereafter, uh, Eisenhower creates NASA. So in 58, uh, Eisenhower decides to bring NASA underneath the civilian uh, administration. And shortly thereafter, uh, our first Mercury 7 astronauts are selected. Um, so April 9, 1959, is when our Mercury astronauts are, are introduced to the world. And there are there's images there of, of the Mercury 7. And initially, uh, they thought the astronauts would be PhDs and engineers, uh, but Eisenhower wanted to our first astronauts to be our military pilots, test pilots, um, the best of the best. And so that's why, out of the seven, um, they all had some type of military experience, test pilot experience, because uh, that was very important to Eisenhower. So the astronauts had to go through various degrees of training. Um, what they had to do was understand what type of endurance the human body uh, could have under G-force loads. Uh, they had to understand what the body would do and how it would react to the extreme heat, uh, extreme cold. Um, they also had to do survival training. In the event the spacecraft came down uh, off course, uh, they had to learn to survive in the wilderness um, for days. Uh, in fact, if you go down to the museum, one of my favorite artifacts uh, is a little piece of uh, dial soap uh, that Gus Grissom took with him. Uh, it was in his survival kit, and I always wondered why you would take dial soap with you on a 15 minute suborbital flight, or if you got lost um, in the wilderness, um, would you really care how you smell? Um, <laughs> but it was because if, if Grissom was injured uh, or had a cut, um, the dial soap would be used to, to clean that wound and, and help prevent infection. 
So what was Project Mercury? Uh, Project Mercury was our first attempt to get humans into space and to get humans into orbit. And there were three primary objectives. The first was to place a manned spacecraft into orbit, uh, preferably with a human inside of that spacecraft. Uh, the second was to understand performance and capability of the human body in space. So again, what would excessive G-force do to the body? What would the extreme temperatures do? What would the vacuum of space do to the body? And then the third and final was to recover an astronomical spacecraft. See? So again, it's a race. Um, so who's going to get first? And, and uh, at this point, we're doing this with the Soviets. The Soviets scored another significant milestone in the space race, uh, April 12th, 1961. Not only does Yuri Gagarin become the first human to enter space, but Yuri Gagarin becomes the first human to orbit the Earth. Um, and this is a huge blow to the Americans. Uh, again, at this point, it's, it's not only about the race to space and first, but it's also about the ideology and the propaganda. Uh, we are superior. Uh, and this was a huge blow to us as Americans and our psyche. Uh, and Khrushchev took advantage of this. Uh, Khrushchev was a master of propaganda and loved to be first. Um, and that's seen throughout his time uh, in office there in the Soviet Union, but also throughout the space program. And so he took great pride in the fact that his country uh, beat the Americans with the first human to orbit. So shortly thereafter, Alan Shepard becomes the first American in space. And while a great accomplishment, it didn't equal the feat of Yuri Gagarin. So Shepard flies a suborbital 15 minute up and down. Uh, Fairly similar to what we saw this past Sunday uh, with Sir Richard Branson and, and uh, Virgin Galactic. Uh, great flight. Uh, the Redstone, uh, which you can see obviously out front uh, with the, the Mercury spacecraft, the Redstone didn't have the boost capacity to get the Mercury into orbit. It was the Atlas uh, that would finally get John Glenn into orbit. So um, the, the Atlas at that time was still uh, undergoing testing. Uh, were engineering anomalies that they were trying to work out. Um, so the first two flights were aboard the Redstone. So Shepard scores um, for the Americans. And then shortly after that, uh, President Kennedy, May 25th of 1961, a joint address to Congress, uh, challenges this country to land on the moon by the end of the decade. And that is really an audacious challenge. Uh, at this point in time, obviously, the Soviets are winning. Uh, they have already orbited the Earth. We have one suborbital flight under our belt, and our launch success rate during this period is only about 39%. Uh, so our rockets are failing more times than they're succeeding. <laughs> the understanding the significance of scoring that first being the first to touch on the moon. And again, it's not just a technological advantage, a military advantage. It's about promoting the United States and democracy and being superior to allowing our allies and our adversaries to understand that the U.S. And democracy will win out and it's superior. So Kennedy, knowing all of this, challenges the country to reach the moon by the end of the decade. Which leads us to Gus. <laughs> so, Gus Grissom, uh, best of the best. Uh, in fact, um, I, I read an excerpt, thank you, Maria, uh, in a, a book um, that talked about uh, Gus Grissom. And uh, I believe he, he suffered from hay fever. And had that not um, been exposed during all the testing, so not only did they have to understand the, the endurance of, of G forces, the temperature, and things of that nature. You also have to understand that uh, just about every orifice in uh, hole in existence on the human body was prodded and poked in. Uh, they had to endure a lot of medical um, hardships, I guess, if you will. Um, but it was determined that does have hay fever. Uh, if they hadn't determined that, um, it is likely that Gus could have been first instead of Shepard. Uh, but it was that hay fever anomaly 
uh, that forced Gus uh, to, to be second. Uh, so uh, Gus begins his training in preparation for his Mercury flight. Um, and the original seven, um, while they were uber competitive and they wanted desperately to be the one that was first, um, it was also um, the Band of Brothers. Uh, so that's why they called themselves the Mercury Seven or the original Seven. You saw the Mercury logo. And then they each named their spacecraft. So Alan Shepard was Freedom Seven. Gus Grissom was Liberty Bell Seven. Um, after obviously the, the Liberty Bell. In fact, you can see obviously that on display, um, they painted the crack of an homage to the Liberty Bell. So Grissom began his preparation for his flight. <coughs> Getting suited up, ready to go. And on July 21st, 1961, Gus Grissom launches from Complex 56 uh, aboard the Redstone, uh, Mercury Redstone 4, uh, Liberty Bell spacecraft. And pilot of Karen's uh, textbook flight, same as Shepard, 15 minutes suborbital, basically up and down. Uh, lands in the Atlantic Ocean. You can see the recovery carrier off in the distance, and then the uh, helicopter there um, to recover uh, Gus Grissom. Uh, again, textbook uh, in, in Grissom was one of the best. Uh, so he's preparing his spacecraft, uh, doing, going through his checklist, and yet to uh, prepare the suit. So uh, if you're familiar with the Mercury suit, uh, we have Wally Shiraz flowing mercury on display downstairs. Uh, before you exit the spacecraft, you have to plug the ports and you have to put that down in. And this prevents uh, the water uh, from filling the space. So Grissom had yet to do this. As Grissom is sitting there, um, the hatch on the capsule blows prematurely. Unlike the Apollo, the mercury hatch is bolted in place. So uh, there's approximately 70 bolts uh, that go around the exterior and, and place uh, that hatch along that hatch in place. Um, the astronaut, when he was ready, would then hit a plunger, uh, which would detonate um, the, the bolts, which were explosive. Um, so the 70 bolts would explode, and then uh, an explosion would jet some hatch away from the spacecraft. Uh, as Grissom is working through his checklists, here's the boom, and the hatch blows prematurely. Instantly, water starts flooding into the spacecraft. Again, thank you, Maria. Uh, in uh, a book um, by Douglas Brinkley, a um, phenomenal historian and author, uh, he depicts what the public was actually seeing on TV. So as water is flooding into the spacecraft, as Grissom is drowning, the public is seeing on TV a landing and a recovery that is going by the book. Uh, what had happened was they had filmed uh, the, the rehearsal um, for the recovery. And so the networks, NBC and I think maybe CBS, uh, then showed that film rehearsal as what was happening uh, during the course of Grissom narrowly escaping uh, death. So the public became confused because they're seeing one thing on TV but then they're getting reports from the media about Grissom narrowly escaping. Um, so it, it led to a really confusing time, perhaps helped spur some of the conspiracy theories um, further down than the Apollo. But anyway, Grissom uh, is fighting for his life. Initially, the recovery helicopter connects to the spacecraft. The second copter comes in and sees Grissom is struggling. He's drowning. He initially was waving. They thought, well, that means he's okay. So they, the first helicopter was paying attention to the craft. The second helicopter, realizing that Grissom was drowning, picks him up, gets Grissom up. They then attach to the, the spacecraft, and at this point, water has flooded in, um, so the, the weight of the spacecraft is too heavy uh, to lift it up out of the ocean. So what the recovery copter was going to do was they want to tug it back to the carrier. As they started tugging it, a light went on. Uh, emergency light, warning light, you know, in, in the helicopter cockpit, uh, indicating that there were metal shavings uh, in, in the oil. And so, fearing that the, the copter um, would go down, they, they cut the craft loose. So, this is July 21, 61. There's another view of 
try to pull the, the helicopter up. Grissom being rescued and the Liberty Bell. You'll know, I don't know if you'll be able to see them. See the, uh, the die there? Um, so that's a die marker, um, and that is to help locate the spacecraft. So the recovery copter, um, we see the die, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in, in a while. If I forget, it might. <laughs> the Grissom safely aboard. Um, he gets onto the ship, obviously he's drenched. Uh, Kennedy calls him. Kennedy hears about the issues and calls to ensure that Grissom's okay. Grissom's still soaking wet um, from that and he's talking to, to President Kennedy. So, fast forward. Uh, fast forward to the 80s. And a fledgling operation called the Kansas Cosmosphere and Discovery Center um, is formed. And this museum begins to create symmetry that tells the U.S. side of space exploration. And the museum recognizes that it wants a flown Mercury spacecraft. Well, all the other Mercuries are already accounted for in various museums across the country. So the only available Mercury just happens to reside at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> so the Cosmosphere, um, working with uh, Kurt Newport, who is a deep sea uh, salvage expert, uh, begins to chart a course to recover the space now. Um, so beginning in the 80s, Kurt and Cosmosphere begin interviewing uh, scientists, NASA, uh, studying the ocean and the wind and currents, all in an effort to determine where the spacecraft might be located. Um, and so it was a, a long, arduous effort to try and figure that out. Also at this time, the technology that existed wasn't sufficient to try and locate uh, something that was 16,000 feet beneath the surface of the ocean, deeper than the Titanic. <clears throat> so in 1999, Oceaneering, or I'm sorry, the Discovery Channel, uh, approaches uh, Kyle Spirit and Kurt Newport um, about leading an expedition to find and recover Liberty Bell Center. So, obviously, a lot of work had already taken place, and so Kyle Spirit, Kurt Newport, uh, and the deep sea salvage company called Oceaneering um, team up together to go out and find Liberty Bell Center. So that's Max Airy, um, Cosmosphere's CEO and president at the time, who was instrumental uh, in the Liberty Bell. And then the center there is Kurt Imports um, as they are looking at uh, various documentation. So in April of 99, uh, they set out the expedition to try and, and locate uh, Liberty Bell. So the only way to try and figure out where the castle was is to take a, a plot of, of ocean uh, where you think it's going to be, and then using what's called a side scan sonar, start to identify targets on the ocean floor. And, and how they did it is it's basically it's called mowing blocks, as if you were taking a rumble and you were going back and forth. Uh, creating a pass across your yard. And that's essentially what they did. So they took the, the area that they were that they thought it would be able to be and then they began mowing the lawn. So the ship was towing the side scan sonar behind it, back and forth. And as they towed it, they began to get lips. And these are targets at the bottom of the ocean. And sonar technicians read those targets and then determine if it is a viable target or not. Um, I believe they hit 18 targets and then had nine that they identified as being a uh, potential Liberty Bell 7. So, target one, they go. Drop down, you're going to look at the first of nine targets. Target number one is Liberty Bell 7. Um, it was fake and luck. Um, 
So they dropped an ROV, a remotely operated vehicle. It's like a big underwater robot. Uh, the robot's equipped with obviously camera, it's equipped with light, um, but it also has armatures and arms. And so there's, again, you're talking three miles plus below the surface of the ocean. So there's somebody up here, and then there's the ROV down here with a whole bunch of heaven um, between the two. So there's a technician up there who is operating the ROV in the armatures um, that ultimately will clamp onto the top of the river really well set. So they locate the first target. The ROV then attaches these clamps to this structure of the capsule. And then obviously the tethered hooks are there that then they would hoist the capsule up. As they start to hoist the capsule up, and at the time they see them fairly rough and choppy, hoisting the capsule up, the tether that connects the two snaps. So Liberty Bell 7 is lost for a second time. Six, back down to the bottom of the ocean. Fortunately, they have the target. They know the coordinates. So they go back to port. They lost the ROV, um, so they had to go back to port and literally rebuild a second ROV. So they're at port rebuilding the second ROV. And then in uh, July uh, of that year, <clears throat> that night, they set back out to recover the Liberty Bell for a second time. So on July 20th, 1999, and as Navy said, what happened on July 20th? <laughs> Apollo 11. The anniversary of Apollo 11, Liberty Bell is recovered. Recovered almost to the day of its initial launch. You can see the, the significant corrosion here. So that's, that's from salt, uh, calcium uh, deposits at that level. But they bring Liberty Bell 7 up. They get it up onto the ship. And if something has been submerged in water, in particular salt water, for a long period of time, the worst thing that could happen to that artifact is to have air hit. So Superior Boy <coughs> here in town fabricated a special holding tank specifically for Liberty Bell 7. That tank was then filled with salt water. And then Liberty Bell was placed in that tank. It was a bottom of the top. Uh, and then Liberty Bell was shipped in that tank. So it the, the corrosion um, would advance. Uh, sitting in that salt water, it would halt any uh, corrosion that might be caused by exposure to the air. So they get the capsule up, but, but there's one thing they have to uh, uh, do first. So uh, the, the early Mercury capsules were equipped with a, a little bomb, so bomb. And the reason why was if the capsule went off course, uh, and it was thought that the Soviets could potentially recover the capsule, they would detonate this bomb, which would explode and destroy the capsule. Um, so the SOFAR bomb was still inside the spacecraft. It had not been detonated. But what they didn't know was whether it, that bomb was still alive. Uh, so they had bomb experts on board the recovery ship. So these two gentlemen are the lucky ones who get to go out and find the so far. Everybody else, so yeah. You see these big containers here? So the ship has these containers. Everybody else is hiding behind these containers in case that, that bomb explodes. But these two guys are like, okay, I'll go out. Uh, they fortunately uh, disarm the bomb without any issues. You see a picture of the bomb there. And if that bomb went off, I'm really sure these protective bodies. <laughs> 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 and there's her new board with Liberty Bell 7. She's up, she's safe. You can see the corrosion up here. But then look look in here. Uh, this it, it's just full of corrosion, but from the bottom of the hatch. 
the bottom of the cockpit as well as debris. So there's the craft getting loaded into the, the container. These are these are styrofoam cups. There's a bag of them. These were attached to the ROV. Um, probably, probably 16 ounce styrofoam cups. And so they put them in the net and then attach the net to the ROV. And then obviously those cups travel down to the ROV. But look look at the size the cups are upon bringing them back up. The pressure at that depth squeezed all the air out of the styrofoam cups, literally crushing them. And so you take a 16 ounce styrofoam cup that's about this, and when it comes up, it's, it's about this size. It just shows you how much pressure is at that depth. Put the lid on, on the capsule. So, anybody know who this is? Good. Yeah, Gunther. Uh, so Gunther Bent. Um, Gunther, uh, <coughs> individual. Gunther Bent is a pad leader. Um, Gunther, uh, German, uh, was, was actually a, a Luftwaffe pilot. Um, was shot down uh, during World War II. Uh, at some point, Gunther immigrated to the United States. He then went to work for uh, McDonald. Uh, McDonald was the a contractor who fabricated the Mercury spacecraft. And so Gunter uh, was, was one of McDonald's employees. Uh, at some point, Gunter then uh, becomes a NASA employee and he is charged as, as the pad leader of the, the closeout, the person responsible for the closeout. So Gunter was the pad leader from Mercury all the way through early shuttle. And so what he, what he was responsible to ensure that the spacecraft was ready. Uh, everything was a go with the spacecraft. Uh, when the astronauts came up, uh, he oversaw the final checkout of the suits to make sure they were ready. And then he oversaw the, the closeout, uh, the, the, the hatch being closed out, and then making sure that everything was prepared for launch. So Gunter is an amazing individual. Um, in fact, if you go down into the White Room uh, on display in our museum, uh, it is signed by Gunter. Gunter was on board the recovery ship, and the, all the people involved, excuse me, with recovery signed the tank, and there's Gunter signing the tank. And then a toast uh, to its recovery. So it's it's then brought back uh, to Canaveral, Port Canaveral, uh, July 21st. Uh, there, uh, it's loaded onto a trailer. Uh, and then from that point, it is transported here to the cosmosphere. Uh, again, our Space Force team, experts in the restoration of, of space artifacts, primarily uh, space and spacecraft, uh, is going to be a group that's charged with, with bringing this precious artifact back to life. Uh, so that's uh, the arrival of the Curie <coughs> Bell. You can see the redstone there. Um, so initially, they're, they're letting the water out uh, of the shipping container, and then it's lowered down into the museum. Many of you probably saw uh, the restoration take place. Uh, brought lowered down into our pit, taken into the museum, where our space works team had set up a shower. Um, it's actually kind of just a kiddie pool uh, with some curtains and a, a shower head. Um, so what they do is they then begin flushing it with clean water. Um, so it resided in salt water. Now you've got to get the salt out. Uh, the, the biggest contributor to corrosion would be embedded salt in the material. So think of it similar to when you go to a dentist. When the dentist works on your teeth, he, he can remove the, the decay that's on the surface, but it's the subsurface that has the issues. So the dentist has to drill down uh, to, to get the decay of the cavity. And similar to that, the, the, because of the pressure and the longevity of the spacecraft at the bottom of the ocean, that salt, that calcium, has penetrated the material. And so 
we've got to draw it out, flush it out. So for the first month, it literally sits in its own little kitty pool, um, getting shallow constantly. There it is being lowered. So this is this is the landing pad. That helped soften the, the impact when the spacecraft came down. The, the chutes were primary um, to respond to the track to, to create the, the slow the spacecraft down. But the landing pad helped soften the blow um, when the spacecraft uh, hit. And usually the heat shield would be attached right here. A brilliant heat shield. So you saw that earlier picture. This is this is all in the um, inside here. And you see this right there? That's a mercury head gun. Um, so Gus and the launch crew wanted to take some mementos uh, on the flight. Uh, they wanted to be able to have something that they could give their friends and families. Um, so inside the spacecraft, they put 52 mercury head dimes, and then they put five silver certificates. And the Cosmosphere had always heard that this um, had, had been done, uh, but didn't know for sure. And I talked to some of the engineers, and they said, yeah, we did that. But um, it wasn't until, as they started to dig through the muck, um, that they located the first time, so they knew the stories of the real. So they did locate 52 mercury head guns. Um, they were all scattered um, throughout the cockpit. And then the five silver certificates were wrapped in plastic and attached to the floor the wiring bones or harnesses of the spacecraft. So you can see you can see the corrosion. So that's that's the salt housing and corrosion. And then this is this is corrosion created by two things. Um, one, obviously the salt, but there's also a lot of electrolytic activity at those depths. So there's a lot of electric action that's taking place. And the main console, um, which is right here, which would be in front of, of Gus, um, was there's a lot of magnesium utilized to, to create the, the metal on that console. And magnesium doesn't react well with electrolytic activity. Uh, so the, the console um, started to corrode and deteriorate significantly. The one thing that probably saved the spacecraft was that beryllium heat shield. Uh, that, that beryllium heat shield acted as a, a sacrificial lamp, kind of like a battery, it was the anode. So the, the electrolytic activity um, hit that beryllium heat shield first. In fact, I don't think I had a picture of it, but it's a picture of, of Liberty Bell and the bottom of the ocean. And all around it is this white substance. And that's the, the brilliant heat shield that had basically dissolved because of the activity. The exterior of the spacecraft is, is titanium. Um, so it, it's it will withstand that. The interior where there's a lot of magnesium couldn't. So that electrolytic activity started attacking the, the main control panel. So if you were sitting in the cockpit uh, going left to right, it started attacking that. And so that's why if you look at the spacecraft, if you were sitting in the cockpit, that right hand side um, is more corroded than, than the left hand side. It's just that's the path um, that that corrosion is taking. So that one of the other objects that they found inside is Gus's Ramble knife. Um, all Mercury astronauts were given Ramble knives. Even to this day, um, Ramble knife is a very popular knife in, in the, the world of those who, who like knives. Um, the the Ramble knife was a survival knife, but it was also strong enough to cut the top of the spacecraft out should the astronaut need to escape. So the very top of the craft, the astronaut could take his knife and start cutting his way out should he have to escape out of the spacecraft. So that's a picture of the control panel. You can also see the condition of the wiring harnesses and bundles. So there's there's the spacecraft in its in its shower. Um, the, the kiddie pool is just below it. Um, the shower is just above it. And so for a month, we're flushing 
the exterior and the interior, getting that corrosion out. So once once the craft is stabilized, once it's built, it's to the point where um, that, that corrosion, that, that corrosive activity has been drawn out, we begin the process of, of removing the corrosion. So the spacecraft was literally disassembled. Uh, 20,000 plus parts uh, are removed. Every piece of that craft is taken apart from the smallest to the largest. Um, all the switches and gauges and the control panel are literally all taken apart. So there's the shingle pattern. Um, these are the exterior shingles of Liberty Bell. Um, this is the group working to remove the bottom section uh, from the main cockpit. And once the, the craft is half, then they're able to begin removing all the components, including the wiring harnesses. So for a period of, of six months, um, 12 technicians um, they worked two shifts uh, to, to restore that. And the fact that it's done in six months to me is just mind um, this, this probably would have been a year and a half to, to a two year project, um, but they were under huge time constraint. Uh, if you recall, Discovery Channel funded the expedition. Well, how Discovery was going to get its money back was it was sponsoring a national touring exhibition on Liberty Bell 7. And the exhibit was set to open, I uh, believe, the Cape on uh, the Kennedy Visitor Center uh, in May of 2000. And so the, the Later. Yeah, um, so the team had only about a six month window that they had to restore the spacecraft before <coughs> the spacecraft was set to leave to go on exhibit. Um, and so that, that compressed time frame um, created a, a lot of anxiety and stress for our team. That's the cast. So if all of you some of you probably met Dale, he's our SpaceWorks uh, manager. Um, this is Dale when he see. He had started in 98, so he had been with us one year um, and he's still with us today. <coughs> Greg Buckingham, uh, many of you have either heard of Black or Matt Black. Um, he was the lead restoration technician. Uh, that's a picture of, of Greg uh, cleaning one of the components. Uh, you can see the, the a little paintbrush. Um, Dr. Gherkin uh, here locally donated a bunch of dental tools uh, to us. Uh, so we literally used the tools that the hygienist used to scrape your teeth um, to scrape off the, the corrosion um, from, from the, uh, the components. Um, so using dremel tools, uh, dental tools, uh, brushes, it, it, it's almost like an above ground archaeological presentation. They began to remove the corrosion um, from the exterior. That's what one of the components of black pre restoration. There's the Randall knife after restoration. If you remember what that knife looked like when they brought it out of the muck, um, that's what it looks like today. <coughs> Part of the uh, survival kit. Um, Pain pills, motion sickness pills, survival kit, there's my favorite dial soap. <laughs> there's a whistle just in case he wanted to call somebody. <laughs> Here's the helicopter recovery hook, it was still attached uh, to the spacecraft. The five silver certificates. In this one at the top, you see the Liberty Bell crack that they drew in it. This was signed by the launch crew. And, and you would think uh, that these engineers uh, would be pretty smart, right? Well, they misspelled launch. They <laughs> <laughs> were signed Lance Crew. So that was the official Lance Crew of Liberty Bell. Liberty Bell's shape I, don't, I didn't have a picture of 
picture of, of the die canister. Um, but the so you, you saw the die around the spacecraft when when the, when the capsule was brought back up and they had to put the die canister in, in its own um, little tank um, to restore it. It was still a big die, believe it or not, which is still crazy. So these are these are the volunteers. Um, so Grant Buckingham um, obviously led the restoration, and then the, the four gentlemen in the red shirts were volunteers um, who helped with the restoration, and then Jim Franco. Um, and, and Jim uh, retired from Dillon's and then came to work for us. And Jim's tried to retire about a half dozen times from hospital. <laughs> we keep bringing him back. And then this is the main restoration team. There's Dale. And that's what the craft looked like after the restored. Uh, historic restoration, historic project. And because of our efforts, uh, because the Cosmosphere was one of the leaders in the in location and recovery, and because we self-funded uh, the restoration. Uh, Smithsonian and NASA signed title of the spacecraft over to the Cosmosphere. Um, so we own the spacecraft outright. Um, at the time, we were the only entity outside of the Smithsonian and NASA uh, to own the <coughs> spacecraft. Um, today, yes. today, the entities, the museums that, that own the shuttle, um, or house the shuttle on the shuttle. So um, we're no longer the only museum to, to own a spacecraft outright. Those who uh, display shuttles also own the shuttle. But we are one of only four museums uh, in the country that display a flown Mercury, flown Gemini, and flown Apollo. Um, the others are the Smithsonian, uh, the Kennedy Missile Center, and the Space Center Houston. Uh, so we're in some, some pretty good company. And that is Libby Bell in her old display case um, when she went on display for national tour. So April of, of 2000, uh, she leaves to go on tour. Um, and, and so for the next six years, she literally crisscrosses the United States, um, went on display at pretty much every major uh, science center um, across the country. Uh, made a brief stop here in 2003 uh, where the display was set up in the lobby in, in, in this room. And then in 2006, uh, she came back home, uh, but only for a brief period of time. So then she came back home, and then we had her on display down in the, the Hall of Space Museum uh, in the early space flight now. Uh, but then there, were, there still is huge interest in Liberty Bell Center, not just nationally, but internationally. Um, so she began her journey um, literally all over the world. Um, she went to uh, Germany um, for a period of time. Uh, she came back home to the States and, and was on display at the Children's Museum of Indianapolis for three years. Uh, she's been up at uh, Prairie Fire in Kansas City. Uh, and then came back home, um, was set to go to Brazil uh, this month, um, but, but that fell through. So she'll be on display uh, indefinitely, at least uh, through the early part of next year. This is my last slide. Um, and we've got Virgin Galactic, Blue Origin, and SpaceX. Where we're at today is exactly where we were. 60 years ago, which to me is, is amazing. 60 years ago, Alice Shepard and Gus Jason launched suborbital flights. Last Sunday, Virgin Galactic launched a suborbital flight. So, in my opinion, we're at the beginning of a new dawn of, of space exploration. Uh, we're at the start of a new space race. Uh, and the space race isn't between countries, it's, it's between billionaires. Um, so these three space companies represent the future of space exploration. Yes, NASA will be involved, NASA will continue to be involved. But we, 
now have a new partnership, a new relationship. It's a public and private relationship. And so it's NASA utilizing the expertise of these three companies and others, including Boeing, Lockheed, ULA, and working collectively to get back to the moon. Think about this. We have not been to the moon since Gene Cernan stepped off in December of 1972. That's mind-boggling if you think about that. So NASA, working with these companies, will lead the way to get this country back to the moon. Now, this is going to be a race between us and, I believe, China to see who will get back to the moon first. I think ultimately we will. But it's exciting to know that in 1961, we were at the start of space exploration, and the future was in front of us. As we sit here today, we're at the dawn of a new era of space exploration, and the future is in front of us. So with that, I'll open up for questions. Yes, sir. Oh, couldn't that restore Liberty Bell? So did they use the original wiring on this, or did they replace it? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was, uh, when they restored Liberty Bell 7, did they use the original wiring harnesses or did they replace that? And the answer is both. Um, they were able to use uh, some of the original wiring harnesses, um, but unfortunately, because of the, the corrosion, some of where the wiring harness would have attached to was too corroded uh, to reattach the wiring harness. Um, so some of the wiring harness while it was restored was not reattached. And, and we, we, we wanted to try and keep this more like a conservation instead of a restoration. And there's, there's a real difference between the two. A restoration, you try and make something look as it was during its original use, as it was when it came off the assembly line. Um, it's new, it's shiny. With a conservation, you want to preserve it as it is. So. You, you don't change it, you don't add new, you don't repaint it, things of that nature. And so with this, we wanted to try and keep it more as a conservation. And with this, it, there were only two components that we reconstructed. Um, one was the joystick, um, Grissom's joystick, and then the other was that right side of the control panel that had significantly deteriorated. We reconstructed that in plexi. And the primary reason was we wanted to reinstall the gauges and switches um, that would have been there. So, good question. Okay, the last time I was by Spaceworks, the shipping container is still out there in the yard. Correct. Are the autographs still visible? Uh, so, the question was the, the shipping container that you saw um, is still out in the yard, and are the autographs still visible? So, <laughs> With a magnifying glass. <laughs> yes. The ability and the talent of the Space Force team is just so remarkable. How did these folks prepare? What, how did they learn to do it? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, um, and one we get asked often. So the question was the, the, the talent of our Space Force team is, is remarkable, and, and, and they're obviously uber talented. How, how do we prepare it? Um, there's no school that teaches you, per se, how to restore a spacecraft um, or how to uh, replicate a spacecraft. Um, but there are schools that teach you different tricks. And so it's, it's taking a technician who is talented in a wide array of, of tricks, um, carpentry. Uh, metalworking, fabrication, welding, um, and then adapting those skills to the restoration. And so the, the first thing you have to do is, is teach them, educate them about the artifact. Um, fortunately, we either have an artifact on display that they can look at and observe, we have archives, um, and then we have relationships. And so it, it's helping them understand the artifact what material was used to, to fabricate it, um, how it was fabricated, what its original intent, what its original use was. And then going from a macro to a micro, um, you know, you, you look at Liberty Bell, 
and there's 20,000 plus parts, and you'd say, well, how could I possibly even begin to work on that? Well, if you take a, you take a little switch, and say, well, can you work on that? Well, sure, I can take that part, and I can, I can remove the crochet and put it back together. Okay, well, you, you then think through it in that manner and start attacking it from the micro level and then build up to the macro. But really, it's taking people with skills and talents and then adapting that to our projects and what we do here. Fortunately, Dale's been with us since 98, and Don's been with us since 05. Jack's been with us since 97. So you, we, we've got a history. Now, what my concern is, though, we're, we're, not, we're not training the next generation. And so I, I would like at some point, because these guys don't want to retire someday. <laughs> uh, I, I'd like at some point to, to get you know, that, that next generation in, um, to, to get them uh, underneath the, the wings of the, the supervision of, of our guys so we can, we can continue uh, the, the great work that this group does. Jim, we have a question from Facebook, and I, you were talking about the international interest in Liberty Bell 7, so watching online this morning, we have a viewer from Italy and a viewer from England joining you via, via Facebook. So the question was, was it ever considered that you just display the Liberty Bell 7 exactly as it looked when it came up from the ocean floor? Say that again, was it just... Did you ever consider displaying the Liberty Bell 7 exactly as it looked when it came up from the ocean floor? Um, so if you heard the question, did we consider displaying the craft as it was when it came up from the ocean floor? Um, the answer is no, because if we would have done that, the craft would have continued to corrode. Um, the objective was to remove the corrosion. Uh, if we had displayed it as it was, um, all that corrosion that you, you saw would have continued to attack the spacecraft. Um, and ultimately, you would just have a shell. Um, so it was imperative uh, that we restore and serve it, um, even though we're, we're changing the look of it from its time on the ocean floor. That, that was due specifically to long term preservation on the spacecraft. Yes? Was there anything you couldn't preserve, like that you found, or you lost through the process? The question was, was there anything we couldn't preserve or that we lost during the process? And, and I, I wasn't involved during the, the restoration. My, my quick answer is no. I think we were able to preserve everything. We weren't able to reintegrate everything back into the spacecraft, but we were able to preserve everything. Good question. Did you get any support from McDonald's for this, like blueprints or military material? Um, <laughs> I want to say we got some blueprints and, and some of the um, familiarization manuals and things of that nature, um, but we also have a lot of that already in our archives, um, so probably limited, but, but not a great deal of support. Other questions? Yes? Jim, it's not a question, but a comment on the Jean's uh, statue out front. Uh, we were lucky enough to be here when it was dedicated and Gene was here. And uh, that is molded off of his moon suit. And so that is an exact duplicate of what it would look like if he was on the moon. Yeah, that, that's correct. So the, the CERN statue out front, um, we, Spaceworks, um, fabricated a replica spacesuit uh, to the exact specifications of, of Captain Cern's uh, lunar suit. Um, we used beta cloth, um, which was the primary material um, used for that spacesuit. So beta cloth is basically um, woven glass and it has a very distinct pattern to it. So if you if you look at that suit, um, you can see the, the beta cloth pattern in the suit. Um, so we created that suit, which then they, they created the mold um, to, to cast uh, the statue. Yeah, great, great comment. Yes? Looking forward, what does the space exploration community think about Space Force? <laughs> 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 I'm 
So the, the, the question was looking forward, what is the space community, space exploration community think about Space Force? Um, I, I don't know what they think about Space Force in particular. What I can tell you is, is that the need to protect space is real. Um, there, there's a real fear that our enemies could potentially attack our satellites, our communication satellites, or our data satellites, or our reconnaissance satellites. Um, and, and so there, there, is a, there is a real need um, to protect space, which has typically been done through the Air Force. So the need to have an independent entity specifically dedicated to protecting space seems a tad redundant. Um, but I will tell you this, anytime that space is mentioned in the news, it's good for us. Um, so if Space Force is mentioned and it's a relevant thing, it's going to be positive for us. Um, so regardless of whether it's Space Force or the Air Force, the need to have an entity protect space is, is real and important. Other questions? Yes, sir. Is there any idea what the uh, cost and a volunteer's help this like, total cost to get the Liberty Bells back? I, I don't know what the cost of the, the recovery mission was, but I do know that the cost um, to do the restoration uh, here at the Cosmosphere was about $250,000 in, in our cost. Yes. I'm curious question. Uh, when you send the uh, Liberty Bell 7 on, loaned it out, is there a compensation for that on a monetary level? Yeah. Uh, so the question was when, when we send Liberty Bell out, do we get monetary compensation? Uh, the answer is yes. We charge a, a release fee, a rental fee for an entity uh, to display Liberty Bell 7. So, we do, we do make revenue off of allowing that spacecraft to, to be displayed. Yes? Are, are you seeing any um, residual deterioration at all? From, from yeah, great, great question. So the question was, are we seeing any residual deterioration? Um, and, and the answer is no. Um, fortunately, Dale uh, is, is still on staff and, and Dale does review the spacecraft on a, on a pretty regular basis, as does our curator Shannon. Um, it's also housed in its own climate controlled environment. Um, so there's a there's a cooling unit, filtration unit that sits on top of that. Uh, state-of-the-art LED lights. Uh, the, the cooling unit keeps it at a constant temperature. Um, I believe the internal temperature is 68 degrees, uh, constant relative humidity. Uh, but then it also um, flushes in clean air and removes the off gas there. Um, if, if we did do that, the, the craft would continue to off gas, which then could further deteriorate. So we remove that off gas there. Um, so because of the way we, we continue to uh, display it, um, because of the expertise of the technicians who restored it, um, here we are 21, day, 21 years after its, its restoration, and it was just the same as it did. Um, on the day it was sent to its first exhibition. Good question. Okay, thank you. And we look forward to seeing you back at the Cosmos Theater.